Welcome to Far Realms Radio. I'm Skylar. And I'm Justin. This is our podcast of many things. Where we give you eldritch advice to improve your Dungeons and Dragons games. Let's dive in. Welcome to Far Realms Radio. Welcome back. Season two, we took a little break, and now we're back. Yeah, Skylar did things, uh, like driving around the entire perimeter of the United States. Yeah, you know, I just had to get it out of my system. I had to go and set a record, I think, and make that thing happen. It's one of those things you have to do. I, it's not really rational. 68 days on a motorcycle. 68 days, me and the wife. It's a lot of days without D&D. We did not kill each other, so it's a testament to relationship, I guess. <laughs> it is a lot of days without D&D. It's a lot of days of interesting culture. And uh, 17,000, more than 17,000 miles. So yeah. it's good to be back. I'm happy to be back. I'm Sounds happy to like be here tonight. it was a trip that took a, an amount of skill to accomplish. Skill, a lot of endurance, yeah. uh, fortitude, but uh, yeah, lots of skill too. And different kinds, like technical skills and planning skills and logistical skills and yeah, all sorts of stuff, which well, is what we're going to talk about tonight, yeah. I think. Ability scores and skills. That's right. In Dungeons and Dragons. So why don't we start with, in a role-playing game, what, we have a lot of different terms, right? Taxonomies. We think mm-hmm. we talk about classes and abilities and attributes, features, stats. attributes, feats, skills, mm-hmm. proficiencies, more. You know, so what, what makes skills skills in role-playing games and in D&D specifically? Like, why, right. what makes a skill? These are sh- shared concepts across a lot of these games, but you see them manifest differently based on the designs. So, in in D anD D for me, skills are essentially just like ability checks that are dressed up and categorized by actions that the PCs are going to take in the world, right? And you usually apply mods from additional sources and all of that. But it's more than just the ability check because it's not just your character's attributive ability it's their proficiency that they've gained in Mm. a particular skill or vocation right right okay so skills are the ability check your ability score plus your proficiency right which is whatever mods plus whatever modifier right you know appropriate yeah i mean i basically think of it like ability plus proficiency plus context whatever the context is and the context looks like in this game advantage or maybe a plus two bonus or if you're looking to really reward a player who once stacked it up a whole lot, then hey, advantage man. and a plus five bonus. Good and, fictional positioning. Right. Should earn you something. The high ground. You have the high ground. <laughs> I have the high ground, Anakin. A bonus on lopping <laughs> I off mean, somebody's Obi-Wan leg. Obi-Wan had that down. He rolled with advantage there for he sure. Did. He definitely did. Uh, but I think that they're more in a game too than just that. And, you know, and across games, this one being, right, whatever your natural, a natural essence is plus your learned essence, you know, like who what you the skills you've learned and uh, that's the proficiency that's what you do but i think they're also a means of communicating between player and dm that these are the things that we know together that this character knows how to do exactly i'm gonna do in the game it's kind of like you know what that character is capable of which does help you plan uh on the dm side of the screen right now you're a big one for history so why don't you walk us through some of the history that you found for this and i have commentary around second edition but so for me, like skills and ability checks are really a big part of like what prevents you from just role playing yourself with all the same attributes, right? Like, right. Like if I play a character who's a talented blacksmith, like I don't know that much about blacksmithing. I've watched Forge and Fire a lot, <laughs> so I know some things, but I don't know blacksmithing, right? And that's something that maybe you're not even gonna role play through it. It's just you know you kind of hand wave it. Mm-hmm. It happens, mm-hmm. um, but back originally we didn't even have like. It's really funny how central ability scores have become to 5e like it's yeah. such a central mechanic they leaned into it really hard and it used to not exist and at one point it was just like an option rule, rule kind of thing in the appendix um and now it's become this this core of the gameplay which i think is really right. interesting um i think dm david wrote a great series about this um on his blog a while back and i've seen it from a couple of other writers but it's like it's a really interesting evolution so when the game came out it originally had no skills 
no ability checks. You relied mostly on improvised rulings, right? I mean, like, it was a combat game yeah, originally, yeah, right? Essentially, it was right? a war game. It came out of war games, and so there just weren't a lot of tools for these zoomed in character situations a lot of the time right, right? And dave arneson is famously known for like saying what rules i just make it up as i go along <laughs> and of course gary couldn't you know guy x couldn't handle that so honestly the ability checks and skills as we know them the way we use them today didn't show up until 2000 and that sounds like really late for you know people who've been playing D for a while i mean in second edition they had like proficiency that you could have then they had <laughs> it was so clunky it was there was weapon proficiency, and that made sense. Like, you knew how to use these yeah. weapons in this armor. And then there was non-weapon proficiencies. And we all were like, why did you call it that? Why didn't you just call it skills or... What, what did that even designate? Proficiencies. Just oh, proficiencies. It was just proficiencies that weren't weapon-related. And it was... Yeah, it was... That- it everything just shows else. you how combat focused everything right. was. And it was everything else. It included like Boyer and Fletcher, blacksmithing, entertainment, you know. Yeah. And you were assumed if you were proficient in that, that you had enough skill to make whatever you needed on hand given resources, didn't give you rules. Of course not. You know, or make a living <laughs> doing that in a sort of general way. Yeah, you got the like you can get this amount of gold or like you can live on this kind but of deal. But even for a combat focus, here's here's I guess the point of why I asked this thing, why why they started to include it, because I think it's a reasonable question for a player to ask, all right, I'm gonna I'm playing an archer. Uh, I know how to make my own bow. I'm a ranger, right? Mm-hmm. I'm I'm like living as an elf in the woods. I should know how to make a bow. So what is that? How do I know? Is it that I'm an elf and I know how to do that? Well, what mm-hmm. if I'm like where a, does that come from? A human that's living in the woods. Do I automatically get that knowledge, or is it the training that I got? And uh, because I want to be able to, I, I, we're tracking arrows, so I want to be able to like make arrows. We're camping, it's a guys. Good I'm out of arrows, you know. So whole train of thought down how you could get there. So. That's why I think it came about in that way. They're like, oh, yeah, your proficiencies are based on your class. Yeah, right. That lets you, if you want to be a shooty fighter, you then you like can Ability checks here and there. I, I think I could be wrong because I'm not super familiar with the original they 2E. Did. They gave, they gave. Wasn't there like that charisma check sometimes in an encounter and all of a sudden the monster was just friendly to you? Yeah, that, like not, situationally. In, not in 2E advanced. I didn't, okay. Maybe that was an earlier one. I think that there were ability checks and it, there was an example they used for... If you encountered a monster and it wasn't immediately hostile, you know, yeah, that like, was let's it. say you encountered yeah. a hobgoblin. It was like the one time you used your charisma. That's and why you I remember it. And you want to not like, have it kill you automatically or yeah. not kill it automatically, you would do a charisma check. And the example they gave that was, was in 2E, you wanted to roll lower. Yeah. was the idea, right? Roll so under. if you had a charisma check and you had a charisma of 16, you had to get 16 or under. Except for strength, which was a special case because <laughs> it had a separate subtable. Oh, my God. If you had an 18 strength. In which case, you, you had to roll this. in a D100 table for what level of 18 percentile. strength. Right. And then, but that determined the modifier for your strength bonus. You still had to make a strength check under 18. It was like... It, it was, was... The strength thing was ridiculous. It was bonkers. It was silly. It was just silly. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Like, yeah. Like you said, like, at that time, it was, like, really more of just the sustainable living of outside adventuring. Like, what, you know, skills might your Yeah, I mean, mostly have. focused on what you'd cover in athletics nowadays. You Honestly, know, it yeah, was like, so much of it's covered by just singular skills now. Right. Strength and dexterity. We're like, oh, can you chop down a tree? Make a strength check, you know? Uh, yeah. Can you dodge it's the... just a lot more improvised Across rulings. the river. Make a dexterity. Yeah, it's all athletics. You know, it was just like, oh, okay, we'll just figure it out as we go. And, like, the funny thing is Gary Gaius was kind of like against ability checks because we all know he loved improvised rulings that's kind of his style is know everything and make improvised rulings and if you don't know everything you fail but it's okay you also (laughs) didn't fail thanks gary it's like what what are you talking about dude jerk (laughs) classic gary double talk but uh (laughs) they actually first appeared in the dungeoneer survival guide in 1986 um, and that was where you kind of saw some of the first use of ability checks and skills. And they use that roll under system like that you were talking about where you wanted to actually roll under the number right. because the higher you had, you know, right. they were all about rolling low, like it was golf or something. I don't know. And now, thankfully, we flipped that around with most things because it just it's more intuitive that more numbers are better. Um, not always, but sometimes. <laughs> but essentially, they, they showed up in 86 and they showed up again in the glossary of the 89 player's handbook. Like, not, you know, in the main stuff. Like, you know, in the back. Like, it's That's there. where I read it. That's yeah, where I was interested. right? You could yeah. use it. It was an <clears throat> optional kind of rule, right? Like, it was there. And like you were saying, like, it was not symmetrical. It was so asymmetrical in how it was set up. Like, <laughs> you never used charisma. No. You used strength a lot. Like, you dex knew, was always useful. What's a wisdom check? Right, yeah. You know? what, like, what's an intelligence check? 
Yeah, they were. Yeah, essentially, you were doing mostly like athletics checks. Can you jump across this chasm? Right. Like stuff like that. Can you open, break down the door, kind of stuff? That's what I remember. Like That's from the, the percentile, example. it was like, can I break down the door? Mm-hmm. Roll. Let's find out. Um, and then third edition really embraced this, like kind of out of the blue, almost from where we were in second. Um, each skill, you know, is tied to a particular ability score, um, and they did a really good job of categorizing the skills um, more to be mostly like verbs that explain a character's action in the world. I think that they went a little too far in 3.5. Like jump is a skill. Use rope is a skill. Yeah, use Which rope. I think is hilarious. Use rope. Disabled device. I kind of like that one. Disabled but device, I could reason There's through. a lot of skills in there that you're like, I feel like some of these could put under an umbrella of what encompasses different skills. Yeah. And you see, you've seen Pathfinder do that with like right. thievery, I believe is a good one. It kind of right. encompasses all those thief things. Um, the only danger there is it's a little bit more uh, vague, right? Because like the other verbs are so specific and that's kind of the point is kind of you're like, okay, I know exactly what action this encompasses. And when you use something like thievery, you almost have to put a parenthesis after and list a couple of example actions that that includes, right? Because right. like I know pocket. in 5e, people are like sleight of hand. Okay, so... What exactly does, how far can I stretch this? <laughs> right. You know, like sleight of hand, like, okay, maybe I could just swipe that, you know? Versus, can I just steal this? Can I like have a dagger magically up like, my sleeve right? somewhere? Can you know? I just, mm-hmm. what does this include? How far What's can I go with pockets? this? What's right? in his pockets? But that's an example of how the game tries to support that style of play. I mean, we all know somebody who played Skyrim to play a Khajiit so they and could steal, steal everything. everything. That's, what you everything. Do more, that's how you play Morrowind, right? All of the Elder Scroll games, I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what I did. But I didn't know there was another way to play. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, and of course, in third edition, we had a kind of that treadmill where the DCs of everything would have to scale to keep up with the characters. I and think this was fine, actually. This is a side note. I think it was okay. The Every flaw- now and then, you'd have a certain issue, like... If you wanted to challenge the barbarian, you'd have to put a door in there yes. that had like yes. an insane DC. And it kind of sucked when like the wizard's like, ooh, I can finally take down a door. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, no, the doors are made of adamantium now, so no, you can't. But the reasoning would be that the you know, the wizard would blast it open or use a spell anyway. I mean, yeah, you have not. But you could also right, exactly. But you could also, you know, customize your characters in all sorts of interesting ways. And yeah, there's an endless treadmill, and yeah, all that stuff. The problem wasn't that there was an endless treadmill, it was that to, because of the endless treadmill, they had so many different kinds of bonuses, and it's hard to keep track. it was hard to add. You had to like do the on the fly math in your head a lot. It just took a long time to add it all up. Yeah, you know. So you usually ended up just writing shortcuts on your sheet, like right. notes. Like, okay, if I do this skill, I have to add this much. Right, exactly. And you have to update it every time. All the time. And that was fine. It, honestly, the one thing I did love about three five, especially playing a rogue, is you got so many skill points. You did, and it was really cool to be like. Yeah, my character's okay, at, like combat or whatever, but he's so good, dude. I got at, this. Like this one yeah, thing, but whether he's like, yeah, I got he's that like too. the greatest lock picker who's ever lived, and that's kind. Of, it, it would allow you to make the skills more customizable, part of who the character was. Bards are like that because now. now we have backgrounds, but yeah. a lot of the time the backgrounds doesn't really give that that appreciable of skills. You know, you're like, oh, you're a blacksmith. That's cool. You're never gonna be crafting anything. Let's go kill goblins. Right. Yes. Like, cool. That's that's what you <laughs> used to do. Now you're an adventurer. Yes. You're no longer one of those plebeians. You forgot how to do that. Doesn't matter. Yeah, it's, it's fine. You yeah. have a world to save. Yeah, exactly. Uh, fourth edition kind of took this almost too far. I mean, I think that fourth edition had some good ideas about skill challenges. Skill challenges were fun. And it, it was a new idea in tabletop gaming generally at the time. You know, like, mm-hmm. what does it look like if you have consecutive roles? How do you maintain drama between them? How do you map the success and failure to a How branching path? How do you prevent path? that everyone roll situation? Yeah, that was some of the things we saw that started to happen in third edition, but fifth edition has a, a, a real mm-hmm. thing with. But um, uh, the thing I think about fourth edition skill challenges was it was a novel idea to build an extra system for players who didn't want all their crunch to come from fights, uh, which is one of the areas that 4th yeah, edition broke down. It was a down, great right? way to highlight non-combat skills. I right. love it as a player and a DM. I thought it was one of the best parts of 4th edition. I, I don't think the implementation was that good. I agree with that. I, I think that it basically is It's just that they didn't structure it as well. They, they didn't, in a classic, I don't know if it's just I'm the big dog in town, but like learn from the other games in the market. You know, fifth edition did a lot of that, which is really great. But uh, you can see it in the design. But in fourth edition, they're like, we're going to re- redesign everything, and they and they learn from the video games in the market. And uh, the skill system just wasn't. I don't know. It didn't. It yeah. didn't capture it. The I use but a modified. Yeah, every, everybody would roll. You yeah. Know? And then yeah. And then there's like no guarantee. 
there's no chance of failure because you're exactly. going to get, of course, enough success. Statistically, someone will roll high in an average size party. It'd be like a dramatically, wow, so rare, the, the villain actually got away. You know, yeah, it's like almost, yeah. It was really frustrating. Yeah, hard to plan As for. As a DM sometimes. Because, yeah, you're like, well, how do I plan for the failure that's so not going to happen? I'm just never going to use a skill challenge if I, yeah, you know, right. I'm like, all right. I, I use a modified version of skill challenges in 5e, and, like, you can do it. You just got to put certain things in there, like... You can only do. Fruit cards. You have to be, yeah. You have to be proficient in the skill to like to make the roll, so that you don't Fruit always. Cards. Yeah, you don't want the active players always taking over. You know, and be like, oh, I do this and I do this because. You're you gonna just always, toss a fruit cart in their way. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I also <laughs> always there will always be a fruit cart in any chase scene ever. Doesn't matter where you are. Uh, I mean, yes. it, was, it was a cabbage cart. It was a little uh, avatar homage the last time, actually. I think that <laughs> I think that the the thinking about what skills can do, you know, it, because there's such a broad ability, you know, the limit really is your imagination. It has made designers shy away from it in D and D for a while. And, you know, they fourth edition really was more tactically more. This is a fighting game, you know. Mm-hmm. Like it was you, a like, combat simulator like you often at the, say, its core. This is a game about fighting monsters and taking their treasure. And that's what it's about, and it's true. <laughs> it's um, about murdering things and taking their stuff. It doesn't have to be just that. <laughs> And skills are the way by but which that, it's not. It is where the reward based world loop is designed around those actions. Well, that's you don't what, get experience from anything the, except murder. No, no, there are you can get experience for other things. They give you they give you examples of how the DM can you reward can now, experience. But for, it is still alternative rules usually for role play yeah, character yeah. moments. I mean, I don't or, think that's a bad thing. It's just you have to find a good systemized way to do yes, it. Right, and, and it's you can't have less, shifting goalposts in a reward system. It's it, frustrating. It requires a little more work. You know, yeah. the the lazy person is the one who's probably going to just and I'm in this category. Throw the series of monsters and or challenges. Think about it in old three x terms slash pathfinder what's the cr of this encounter total you know and it's because it's easy math you know all right how much damage are we going to dish out probably how often how many hits is it going to take to take out this monster and then Mm -hmm. you give them all of the experience for all of it because the reward is the experience that's the that's the that's That's the the key reward in dnd you know like the only real lose condition is to die right to win like your win condition is don't die. I mean, Level the, up. <laughs> and the assumption is we're going to win every fight that we're going to... Yeah, anyway. The heroes usually win, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Like, you know how hard it is to make a party surrender. They won't do it. They're yeah. like, no, I'm going to brave heart this. I'm, I'm going to die before I go down. No way. <laughs> so, um, but I think that uh, skills don't have that in, in part because there always feels like there's some kind of cost. And I part mean, of the cost, I think, is that it requires more cognitive work yeah. for the players. You know, as we look through the skills and 4E trimmed it down and 5E has a broader skill list and the skills are, they don't get a lot of flavor text. They really know? don't. It's, it's just, it's almost to the point where sometimes as a DM, you're like, how do I adjudicate this? Like, what would this fall under? Because some of them are a little narrow. Um, they definitely simplified the list of skills. I thought it was interesting. I watched it a bit as it went through the playtesting process and they changed the verbiage of the skills a lot. Mm. And I honestly feel like they didn't quite really let that settle. It Mm-mm. felt like they threw the play. Like you might have wanted to play test that part more because it was one of the things that shifted all the way to the end in D and D next. That yep. what it was. D yep. next. Yep. Yeah. But it was kind of cool just to see the process happen. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. I think that there's no shame to all the designers yeah, out there no. in learning and stealing from other systems. You Except know, that's like, how it works. There are right. Go go pull in a more complicated system, and there's no reason that D and D shouldn't be able to support that. Put it in an optionals category, and, and what I suspect they were going to do is like, uh, here's our skills and features supplement well, that comes every out. Every other RPG ever has taken things from D and D, so why not take things from other RPGs? Yeah, right. it's, it's how the hobby's always worked. Right. That's where level ups come from. Is this game? And I guess it really in fifth edition, it boils down to you know, it's it's really back to the same kind of thing. You have your ability score, you have your proficiency, and you have a context. And that's how they kind of tied all those floating modifiers together is with the proficiency. It so was the kind three of numbers, bind. you know, and the fifth, fifth edition has this kind of thing very common. There are basically three numbers you add together at any given time max. You have what you rolled, what you wrote down on your sheet, and then anything else. Anything contextual, contextual. or situational. Right. And, but the, the I think that if I was going to gripe about a thing, it's probably the same thing that you were just talking, you know, we were, we were talking earlier about of. The progression is tied to proficiency. Which is, you can't really adjust it aside from character creation. Scales with your level. And that's it. Right. And I'm like, why don't you give me that tweedly knob? I, I want to... One I of my favorite things about leveling up in previous editions it. was, ooh, cool, I get all these skill points I can allocate. Because you don't get ability scores a lot. You rarely get those. They show up like every couple levels or so. 
So it was always nice to kind of get some skill points, especially if, you know, you had a high intelligence modifier, you're playing a rogue. It was fun. It gave you something to do. You know, it really made that level feel like, oh, cool, I got better at what I do. I agree. I mean, and I think that it's valid that to have a, a yes and, you know, it's not, it's not an either or choice. Totally. Right? Like, there's no reason I can't be a badass murder machine against monsters taking all their treasure. And also be really good at poetry. And also make my own sword. Right. And also be really good at poetry and also be a musician. I'm a battle bard and I'm going to slay all those orcs while composing a legendary Edda. Thank right? you very Why much. Why not? Like, there's no... So, anyway, n- nerd rant. But <laughs> I, I do think that... Uh, it's a, an area ripe for bolting on your own stuff. Yeah. It really makes your game, and it's a good area, I think, to use to customize how the feel of your game is, right? Yeah, there's way by which you is, can do with it. As a DM, particularly, you can say, here are some things you're going to, I'm going to call out explicitly, but we'll, we'll talk yeah, more about that Yeah, you can bolt later. things on. It's not a bad system, uh, but I think what happens where the big problems come with 5e's skill system are just total misunderstandings of how to apply it by players at large. I see it so much. It kind of blows my mind. Um, I, you know, I've, you probably heard me, you've heard me rant about these before. Um, but the first thing to point out, I think with the kind of the misunderstanding of this, the skill system in five E is the idea that there's a skill system at all. Um, this is an idea I first read in an angry GM article, I believe <laughs> many, many moons ago. And it stuck with me because it's like it's really just an illusion of a skill system. It's an ability check, press proficiency, press bonus. You don't level up your skill points. Right. You choose your proficiency. It's a one and done. You're not getting more proficiencies in later levels unless you have expertise class feature. That's pretty much it. And oh, cool. Now you can add double your proficiency. Whoop you do. So customizable. Um, It's just weird that the skill system went from being so customizable to so kind of not. Which, in my opinion, puts it the the emphasis on the DM, right? Because you know you're going to have players like yourself or myself yeah. or others at both of our games that that have this expectation of the game. And they're going to come to the game and you want them to have a good time. So then you're thinking, well, maybe I should grant them a proficiency after some time passes. You know, what did you learn? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And that's You can de- definitely adjudicate that way. And I've done that with feats. Yeah. But... Uh, it, it, the last thing a DM wants is more work. Yeah, right. You're just creating like it's tough because like you don't you can't play test what you're bolting on sometimes you right. know and then you're in play you're like ah oh, fuck I got to change that that didn't work right you know and like if you have cool players it's you know it's not a big of a deal because you're like hey guys this might not work right and we may need to fix it I like the caveat you like and you honestly, should consider this play test that's material fine. like the the important mindset to have if you're play testing like an alteration of these rules is when you go to play at the table even if you especially if you know there's a specific problem. Don't try to sit down with a solution. Sit down, play it, and see what the you know see what solution fits. Don't go in with like I'm gonna I know I'm gonna solve it with this because you may sit see how it plays and be like, okay, that's not a good that might not work. I mean, you have to modify it on the fly. Yeah, right? yeah you, you have, have to you pay have attention. to go in kind of like a blank slate sometimes right. in a play test. Collect data. That's just how play tests work. That's why they're not so fun actually. What, what happens? You know, like <laughs> do they use it? Do they not? When they do, does it feel enticing? Add more enticement until right. they start using yeah. it and then it's, throttle back. Sometimes it's a feel thing, you know? you got to see how, how it works at the table, if it's clunky or not. Mm-hmm. Um, but aside from, you know, the proficiency bonus, you can't really impo- improve your skills or classes directly with, or excuse me, you cannot improve your skills directly without class or feat investment. That's pretty much it. Right. Like, those are the only level of choices you're going to get unless you boost an ability score mod. So, the, like, they kind of soften this with... The fact that there's universal DCs and your proficiency bonus improves with level, but it doesn't feel like anything you have agency in choosing. It's just D&D, D&D has always suffered from this. A D&D character does not become something else. They become a better version of what they already are over and over and over and over right. and over. And so you choose that at the start. This is one of the interesting things. You know, you look at Warhammer, like, for instance, Warhammer uh, Fantasy Roleplay, and it, it inverts that and it, it turns it on its side, really, is the right way for it. Because you pick a profession. You don't have a class in that game. And this is one of the D&D competitors, right, of mm-hmm. yore and still today. And you have that pro- class as a profession, and that levels up some of your abilities, which you persist through professions. But after a certain level of pro- of progression in that class you leave that class and then enter a new profession you had a different one mm-hmm. you become instead of a burglar you turn into a knight or and then maybe after that one you have another one you turn into a priest or whatever it might be and uh, there's some things that persist but you know 
D and D is very much like you are what you are, and now you're a better version of that. And now you're a better version of that, and, and again, and, and again. Third edition was nice <laughs> because it was very easy to multi class. Well, also the prestige 5e, classes made it feel like you could change who your character was a little bit more. Yeah, five E you know? has less of that. Like it gives you branching options for kinds yeah. of things that you picked way back when. But it doesn't. It's yeah. not as easy to customize. That's just kind of how D and D is designed, though. Your characters are just going to improve. They're not going to change who they are but entirely. Still, but about- you can do it with a good DM. They may be like, okay. You've cast aside your weapons, and you've decided to become a priest of this order. So now we're going to just switch your class to cleric. But I think that there's, I think there's something. I mean, yes, maybe that's, you can do that's stuff a, like that. That's a reasonable amount of work, though, to reroll it's your character a lot of work. as cleric. Yeah. You know, the and, system does not help you, right? So, I guess where I'm going with this is, I think there's a reasonable school of thought that says, don't penalize the player for customization. It's already extra work. Let them do it, right? And if you're, and if. If you've designed it well enough, then they have some tools that they can use to help them get there. I think that 5e, in its effort to simplify and bring to people the audience... It does take away a little left, of that power. ...left some of this on the table. Totally. And those of us who have played crunchier systems kind of miss a little more of the granularity. Right. Uh, especially because it's easy to extend in a bunch of other ways, you yeah. know? And you go, well, okay. Just, I think with 5e, you make most of your big character decisions a creation. Like, maybe you pick a feat or an ability score later. Your archetype at level You're, three that's matters. It. Those, that's pretty much your big decisions. But your you know, class and your archetype and right, maybe your background right. and race. I mean, I think it tells you something. Like you said, that by level five in organized play, you have to have your character locked. Yeah. Right? Up right. until and level five, you can change it. You can shift it around. Right. Which but, I think is cool. I mean, it's great. I just think it's interesting that that's the point at which they lock you in. So they went, right. okay, clearly. It says something about the design. This is what you are now. And now you're this. You're locked in. So, yeah, that's kind of the thing. There's always been that like that balance of cu- more customizable versus more accessible and mm-hmm. simplified. And that's always kind of the, the teeter-totter there, where obviously the pendulum has swung back from 4th edition, and things are just a little less granular now. Right. But let's talk about my biggest skill pet peeve, <laughs> or one of them. This is, this is the one this that one I hear the most about. This one drives me nuts. Critical failures as a one, and... Critical success, a 20, do not apply to skill checks. It's not the rules as written. You should read the rules. That's not how they're written. It also (laughs) makes the benefit of having a large bonus mean less because one is an auto fail. I have to say, when you have a high bonus to a skill and you roll a one, but your pluses, your modifiers save you. So satisfying. Oh, that's so satisfying. So satisfying. Yeah, I built my character to be good at this skill. And even when he fucks up, he's good enough that he can still pull it off. That's why I don't like advantage if there's one reason. But that's a side tangent. Yes, yes, I agree. <laughs> I mean, also, if you're applying like a 20 as success and a 1 as a failure, you're completely ignoring the higher DCs. The DCs go all the way up to 30, by the way. Mm-hmm. And also, you're just allowing for like completely impossible and improbable outcomes. And it's going to lead to your players continually trying to do these impossible things, which is going to break kind of the fiction of the game world sometimes. Can. Or it just leads to dis- that matters. disordered play that causes problems. And it just, it just drives me nuts. I mean, I agree. I it's agree. like one of my biggest pet peeves because then people are going off doing this impossible stuff because they rolled a 20 on a skill check. And it's like, this is not an attack roll. So that's, I have two <laughs> comments. One is, I agree with all of that. The second comment is, that's how I feel about the Tarrasque nowadays with bounded accuracy in that, in my opinion, the Tarrasque should not be hittable always. Mm-hmm. That's part of what made the Tarrasque special. Right. You know, that's why I keep coming back to that because I'm like, no, I... Come on, you can't polymorph the Tarrasque. It doesn't work. It spells bounce off it. Come on. Anyway, uh, so, but the, the question I want to ask off of that, I mean, I agree, but why do we keep seeing it in the game? You know, like it continues to show up I think it's time just because again. rolling a critical, a failure, a critical success is probably the most exciting part of a game when people roll. They love it. Rolling 20s and are fun. It, it's a big, no it's doubt. Fun. Like rolling it's 20s a big deal. It, it shifts game momentum. It creates excitement. Whoa, and, yeah, everyone's like, 20! 20. 20. Yeah, it's and, exciting. And like, now the table erupted. It's like someone scored a touchdown And you don't want to be the downer to be the one who's like, you're like, well. Actually, it's just still, normal. It's a good Good success, Actually, but that's it's not... 20 plus 4 is 24. The DC's 25, so they don't make it. Sorry. Good try, though, almost. So, but, so, but I think it was there wasn't clarity around this in prior editions. No, is another and, one. I mean, so the, there's like when you this look history at of it. Other systems like Pathfinder 2, they will allow a critical success or a critical failure if it's over the DC by a certain amount. Yes. So there's definitely layers you could add to this. Like if you really like having critical successes and failures, you could add something like that. I, I think that also. Part of the reason why there is are because some mechanics like that already. D and D and tabletop role playing games are already pretty complicated. You know, you're tracking a lot of different numbers and stats and how they add up on your sheet. And this system is not 
cohesive with the other systems that use the same mechanic in this game. Yeah, right? Right. So it, combat uses d20 just like this. And when you roll a 20, something special happens. When you roll a one, something special happens with skills. Right. There's only a couple times you roll checks. a d20, right? Right. Attacks, abilities, and skill checks, and death saves. Right. That's pretty much like the d20 is a big deal, but only for the, you only really use it with those core mechanics. Right. And only in combat does it matter. And uh, it, the other the other parts, it could. It's easy enough, I guess, to adjudicate around a DM. Can be like, "Oh, you unlock it, super great, and it's silent. Good, good job. You unlocked <laughs> you unlocked the chest. Really, really great. You did a you did a bang up, excellent twenty job. And or maybe you award them with like, "Oh, congrats! You rolled a net twenty. Here's five experience." Yeah, or you could always Something. do like you op- you succeed without a cost versus you succeed with a cost. Like right. you open the chest but right. alert the guards. Of course, this puts it back on the DM. But D and D doesn't do mixed success very well. It it's not really built in there. It's you usually like D and D is like, "Oh, you missed. Okay, your turn's over. Someone else goes. Nothing. Right. You you don't fail forward. Nothing Moving happens. On. Yeah, D and D is not a fail forward system all the time. No. Um, even though that's more modern design, really, you see a lot. I mean, it keeps the game moving, though. And that's, I have to say, that's one of my biggest pet peeves with D&D is like, when it's your turn, you swing and you miss, and you're like, well, I'm done. I Next agree. person. It's right. just like, oh, well, that was cool. What a fun turn. Like, I, it's a hard problem to solve. but Especially it, even if you have advantage. And I've had this. This is like my inspiration, yeah, yeah, I think, really didn't really work. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to use my inspiration. I really want to take this yeah. guy out. And no, I missed. know he's low. And I roll two dice, and it's like a two and a five. <laughs> you're like, like, cool. I have a, like a well, plus nine on this, and womp, I still. Womp, exactly. Womp. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, there, you can you can deal with the critical success and failure, but I think it's something that trips up so much more DMs and players than it should. It drives me nuts. Read the rules, people. Come on, <laughs> come on. You're killing me over here. Get with the program. Sorry, this is like my one of my rant zones for some reason. I in know. D&D I know. The skill system and how people apply it, it drives me nuts. Rules as written. I'm I'm big on that. I don't know. Go read them. <laughs> rules are important, guys. Um, the other thing to remember is like, you really only need rolls if there's a chance of failure or a cost. Don't have players rolling if there's no cost to failure or there's just no chance of it. What's the point? I think that I've seen that happen. People like to roll. It's fun. When there's a D as a stalling technique. Sometimes, Some yes. DMs will use that. Like, give me a roll while they yeah, like, yeah. think Yeah, yeah. Like, you're flipping through a book. Like, uh, uh, Or just like uh. in your mind, like, what is what I want the outcome to yeah. be? Yeah, I mean, we know, we as DMs, we all have those kind of stall techniques. Like, hey, could you roll this check for me? Or, hey, could you look up on your sheet what your bonus to this is? I use these all the time, but I think that it's a far stronger choice, actually, to do what I, I don't do as often as I wish I did, which is to just go, uh, I don't know. Turn to a different player. What do you think happens? Right. And if you have the right players, you can do that. You can throw them a little narrative control and it can be pretty cool. Uh, especially if you know, like, you're like, okay, this is a failure. This is a success. Right? It's, right. You got to be careful with who you hand that power to. Because you always have those players who are like, ooh, a chance to throw the monkey wrench in the game? Yeah, let's see what happens. This will be cool. That's part of it. I mean, <laughs> we have a player at our table that does that, you know? It's, He's good at it. It's fun. Sometimes when you don't die, <laughs> <It's fun. laughs> but not always for when everybody. It doesn't result in your death. <laughs> um, the other thing, so that's something to remember. It's like you don't always need skills. Like something I love to do is if a character's proficient in something, you know, I love proficiency. And I'm like, okay, who's proficient in religion? Just that character. I'll be like, okay, because you spent years studying in the monastery, totally you agree. immediately recognize this symbol as this. And you don't just say like, oh, hey, because you're proficient in religion, you automatically succeed and you know this. Give it a little flavor. You have to point back to the decision that they made that's getting them the payoff, right? It's a decision they made at character creation and the payoff is happening now. Right. So that's where you kind of point that out. Like, hey, remember when you made that decision? Well, it's paying off. Good job, man. Exactly. I mean, I I love proficiencies. I've always loved the options. They they feel like feats, but different. Yeah, scalable. scalable. And and we've talked a little bit about this. Like, you know, it's like, all right, you take skills and you take feats. And what's the difference? And And I think more an action, more it's more an attribute or a feature. Proficiencies, I think of as somewhere between the two, right? Skills, you have them, you're proficient with them, you take an action with them. You're so good at the skill, it's almost become an attribute for you. A proficiency is something, yeah, you've focused on this. You've become so good at this, it's become part of who you are. And there's a broader set of that than what the skills in DD 5e have. And feats are things that you achieved. Mm-hmm. You have this. It's a feature it's a of quality. who you are. Right. You, it's an attribute of yours. Yeah. You know, but um, I think that it's easy enough to modify. Definitely, definitely. Um, the, I think one of the big problems we run into now, and it, part of this I think comes from video games, where it's more point and click, um, is that players will declare skill usages 
I want to use my disabled than, device on that thing in the yeah, room. Right. That rather than like room, declaring their action, right? Because you, it's. I actually haven't seen this at the table. I, I see this. I've seen it. I, I pick it up because it's like something that grates me a little bit. And I know certain players who do it, like even at our tables. And But they do it in a way that's like really respectful, you know? Because it's like that old school play, like, hey, DM, can I roll a spot check? And I'm like, they at least ask for permission, you know, which hmm. is like cool. That's fair. It's like, okay, yeah, sure. Um, like, but it's very different when people think in skills versus actions, right? Because back in the day before skills, you had to think in what do you do, right? And yeah. then the DM's like, okay, what skill fits this? Or like adjudicate, how will I adjudicate? I mean, that's how I think of it. That's uh, the same. Like, Me too. And, and every single time Fiction I'm like, first, please. I'm, 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 my, character, my character looks around the room and then like, I think smells the wind. And I like I, I describe a little scene and then I roll the die. Mm-hmm. But that's just, I think. I mean, I know characters or obvious. players like to think in terms of skills because they want to use the best skill. They do right? also. They want to succeed. And they're like, ooh, can I use this skill I'm good at? Well, and also they want to have a skill in something maybe that they don't yeah. know themselves. You know, like, and, and, I, and I've argued against myself one way and the other for this in both cases, mm-hmm. right? But I think it's totally fair to say, all right, my character is, uh, I, maybe I'm an atheist player mm-hmm. and my character is a religious character mm-hmm. and I want to have knowledge in that stuff that I don't know much mm-hmm. about. Or... Um, a magic character. None of us have magic powers. You Correct. Know? So, like, they would know about God, that stuff that I, I don't. wish I did. Or I want to play a mad scientist who is f- from. Yeah, I mean, that's what skills do. They cover knowledge right. and things that you don't have yourself. Which is why I was talking earlier about like that's I think part of the conversation. So sometimes, yeah, you may need to ask the DM like, hey, is is this skill that I have is it applicable here? Could my character take an action like this? Because I get it. Because you may not know what that skill would actually sure. go with. Or that. even like DM. My character's proficient in Arcana. We have a lot of strange glyphs around here. Do any of them trigger right. in and my character's do, mind? Right, you can do that. Yeah, exactly. I just think it's always good to kind of like, especially if newer players, teach them that the skills are tools to resolve their declared actions. Like, mm-hmm. you don't even have to worry about the skills. Mm-hmm. Just tell me, what is your character doing? What do you want them to do? And the DM's job is to say, oh, okay, you want to do, you're declaring this action. Well, here's how we're going to adjudicate it with mm-hmm. this skill or this rule. And obviously, you know, players, it helps to understand what skills apply in what situations because you want to plan, you want to play well. But you it, have another big pet peeve, though. About- it's so, oh my God, don't even get me started. This is just the warm up. So, <laughs> yeah, big for me is the skills are the tools used to resolve your declared actions. Like, don't go in, I want to make a spot check. It's just like, say you want to look around the room. But why don't you tell us about, yeah, like a passive perception okay. versus looking around the so room? So, that's a great why- point. This is one that drives me nuts, and I get it because when we added uh, passive perception was kind of the influx of this to the third game. Edition, this third edition. Third edition. Passive perception came around, and a lot of DMs were uncomfortable with this, and some players were too because they felt like they were getting cheated out of a role. Um, but there is a big difference between passive and active skill usage, and if you can master that difference, you will be able to apply skills a lot better as a DM, mm-hmm. and you'll make your players feel more skilled. So let's get into like the difference here. Like for example, performing a religious ritual is an active religion check, right? Whereas thinking up religious knowledge you have would be passive. You mm-hmm. can't think harder to remember more. It doesn't work that way. Mm-hmm. Um, noticing things when you unless walk into unless, a room. Unless you're Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, of course. And you know, got a mind palace. The, hey, maybe you right. have that. I don't know. And right. that's be different. You that gotta, should be, but that should be something yeah, different than you gotta just adjudicate differently. Right. <laughs> um, whereas, you know, to use perception as the classic example, per, passive perception would be what you notice when you walk right into a room. Just like when you walk into a room, what do you notice? Like instinctively, right? right? Whereas active perception is you are actively scanning that room you're looking around you're combing the bookshelf you're, you're not just yeah, like walking in and what do you sense it's that yeah you're, you're actively, actively looking right perceiving. and so when passive skills first came along a lot of people are like whoa 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 like you're cheating a roll you're just like adding 10 plus the mod what the hell I, I think that there's some context to add here too though around specifically the knowledge piece you know a character should or shouldn't know everything just a caveat there's a big caveat which is Let's say that you're making a knowledge check in the middle of a fight. You mm-hmm. can easily say that yeah, you're, you're distracted, distracted, you failed, Yeah, you blah, can blah, flavor blah. it up. So, you know, but use common sense, yeah. of course. But sometimes, context is everything, right? Context yeah, it really is comes everything. down to that. It really boils because down Because it's really frustrating when, like, you have, like, a character who's, like, really well studied in religion. Right. And, like, doesn't remember the name of this super common god that everybody's worshiping that he clearly knows and right. should know. It just, it breaks the fiction a little bit. It's like... How would you not remember that? Like, you've studied this for decades. This doesn't make any sense. Right. You're an elf. You've studied this for 100 years. 
How do you not know? And uh, like, yeah, you just had a brain like, fart, guys. Obviously, you can use context and things like that. But it's it, that kind of drives me crazy with the with you know having unnecessary knowledge checks in there. It's that for most of the time, knowledge is going to be passive. Um, and right. it's you know you're you still probably rewarding. either know it or you don't. Yeah, and right. You think about this this other part of the mechanic you were talking about earlier of a skill system. You really are only going to roll your skills when there's some success or failure. At yeah, risk, right? right. You're not going to roll so, without failure being a possibility. What's I hope the not. failure for a knowledge check? You know, is it like well, Jeopardy? No. And then you get to the problem. I give credit to anybody who can do a <laughs> game of Jeopardy. Where yeah, right. It's all about knowledge checks. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it's sometimes with knowledge checks you get that everybody rolls. You know, and like yes. so often I'll limit limit it to who's proficient in this is the, one of the trade offs in, in bounded accuracy, right? right. Like everybody Somebody will has roll a pretty high. good shot. You know, it's all within a D20 range is, yeah. so somebody's going to roll high and somebody's going to get it. it. Statistically, they're likely to get it. Which means if you want that player to be special, so now we have the rules that are not right. serving your, your table dynamic. You want that player to feel special for taking that investment in character creation, then you need to just say, don't roll. Here you go. You know this because, and give them a reason. Flavor it are up, though. Are you proficient? Right. Okay. You ha- then you have this yeah, power. totally. And like the other thing with having all these unnecessary rolls when things could be passive is it's going to slow the game down because everyone's stopping to roll like in the middle of your exposition. Oh, I roll spot check. And it's like, I'm telling you what you, you passively perceive when you walk in. Just let me finish. Which, or you have to, <laughs> right, I know. Which is so like frustrating. It's like just bad, it bad player manners. It disjoints your exposition a little bit. There's, there's, a, I, there's a theory on this that you can make your exposition more interactive as you do it. Mm-hmm. I've never succeeded at this. It's, you know? I could never do it. The, I've, I've seen it happen where the description is like a co-description, you know, and you, mm-hmm. it's like, it's more like improv. Where okay. You, where you... So the DM will set a scene, and then different players have the opportunity to add components to the scene. I mean, scene. I've seen you do this in limited, in limited ways before, you know? like Yeah, like, I, mine pulls most, mostly from fate, yeah. but... Uh, I've seen you pull it off and, and things, so it's just like, what do you notice the most about this tavern? Like, what sticks out to you? And, like, just throwing little bits in air to control. That when I'm like, I don't know what the yeah. fuck this tavern has or in you're it. Like, I'm like, just you, gonna make... You have an idea. Jackie, you walk in the tavern, you know, so... <laughs> This, this what is it having it? <laughs> they probably can't break the game with this narrative control. I'm going to let them do it. Right. Basically. <laughs> Little do you think. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they'll always find a way. I do yeah. think this is something that the game should provide but yeah, it tooling definitely, for. It, it definitely, like, when everyone rolls, it kind of pulls the spot away, away from those characters who invested in those skill proficiencies. He's like, but I'm the cleric. I know the religious stuff. Why is everyone rolling for this? I mean, so much of the game is exploring a room. Mm-hmm. And it, it, <laughs> it is, isn't it? It really is. Like so much of it is just like whatever room you're in, you explore it and you see what's there and what you encounter there. It gives you weird habits when you go to rooms in real life because you're like <laughs> looking around. And you're like, I wonder if there's a trap door in here. They what, say, does that bookshelf spin around? They say that Gary Gygax was a master of describing the dimensions of a room. I I would assume I so. Would assume so too. I would not be surprised if he but, was. So you know, the, the thing is that the skills. I guess this really boils down to like who has spotlight. The skills yeah. that, that are for exploring a room quickly dominate a party. You know, the people yeah. who are exploring the room are like, okay, I'm going to explore everything. And then the ones who didn't invest in that are like, um, yeah, I'm just a barbarian hanging out. What can I move or fight? Yeah. Is there you something know? to kill? I'll do it. Everybody gets to participate in combat, you know? So it's just a matter of how to, yeah, you, uh, th- how to cast some spotlight without giving too much. You can right? set the DC so you can higher is another thing, going. right? But then you have the chance of failure increase there, so that that's a good way to avoid everybody yeah. rolling at once. You know, like yeah. if, if so, we're doing you walk into a room, you know, you say, okay, um, who has perception? You know, who's trained in perception? Oh, you notice this, or oh, you, you you get the chance to roll. Yeah, and then other players be like, well, I I probably want to look around too, and they start looking around, and everybody starts rolling. Oh God, right. Or you get like the one player low, rolls low, and then everyone's like hyper suspicious and paranoid, and they're like using the ten foot pole to poke on every tile of the floor. Uh, I'm very much of a different camp with this. <laughs> I, I usually when when there's a call for a perception, or I suspect there's going to be a group roll, what I do is ask for everybody to roll anyway. I'll either go one way or the other. Give the players the information. Mm-hmm. You know, if if it's like an obvious thing, just give it to yeah, them. Just give them. Don't the make info. them roll. Yeah. Here is maybe a secret little bit of information. I totally. mean, the game is about uncovering secrets. Yeah. If there's a bigger secret, give them the small I one. I find for a free. lot of DMs hold onto their information too much. Yes. Like you won't get those big moments unless you give it away. But or the another way to just easily adjudicate around this, I think, is let all the players roll. Let them all roll. They're enjoying it anyway. Whoever gets the highest. Just total. Use, just use that one. And the person <laughs> who invested in it. Yeah. Both. They get right. it. You both are special. Yeah, you can just do something Everybody like that. Everybody else doesn't ev- notice, and you, I'm trusting you to play your character. They don't know right. how you're adjudicating. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. right? But yeah, that like, kind of drives me nuts when people like get super suspicious because like 
do you search the room and everyone rolls bad and they're like, oh no, what if there's now like there's eight, gotta be something there's in eight here. traps Guys, in here I need to rule sure. it out. I need to rule it and out. And you're looking at your dungeon map and you're like, there's literally nothing in this room. Like I've had times where like I've described a room and they're like, oh, I don't trust that book. And yeah, I'm like, I know. and they're like, I investigate <laughs> the book and I'll just be, it's a mundane book. There's nothing special about it. <laughs> and there's the still, they'll be like, no, no, there's definitely something about this. Oh no, that statue over there. How do I know it's not a gargoyle? I fought a gargoyle before. And you're just like, it's a regular statue of an elf, <laughs> but yes, you hit the statue. It is made of stone. Players will so easily I mean, latch on to I'm red I'm totally herrings. that player, right? Yes. I'm always I'm the one going through with the ten foot pole. Like, no, 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 guys, we got to clear the room. <laughs> I think that every time I encounter those, you know, I, I, and this is a skill itself to develop, pun intended, I guess. Mm-hmm. Those there are definitely those players who will seek to zag. Yes, then and, and that's a good example of that. And skills are that way too. DM, I'm going to use uh, perception on this room also. DM, I'm going to try and sleight of hand this guy's pockets. I'm going to sleight of hand that guy's pockets. I'm going to sleight of hand that guy's pockets. <laughs> Every NPC ever. So you know, I usually think about what is the story I want to tell with that. You know, and okay, you're continuing to swipe everybody's pockets. Okay, here's an like, easy what reward. What can you do with the narrative? Here's there. A, not even toward the main narrative. Like, okay, here's a little subplot I'm going to do. You know, oh, and yeah, you, just like you, little, you little narrative some little controls coins and out tweaks. of that guy, and then the next one has nothing, and the next one catches you, and then the next time I'll, you know, maybe it turns out that it was actually a guard. Oops, and now you're in trouble really actually and well yeah you give the consequences right like there's a way increasingly to, more stick there's a way to do it without making it totally unfun you know and like at a certain just point a sort it's of like, like broadcasting warning this is where this is going you're gonna keep going this road here is where this game goes like this here's a clear and more painful warnings right. yeah like <laughs> the, the guards will defend the town like if you murder hobo all day they'll guard all day maybe the next person is a vigilante and they turn around and clock you and no it's not a role for initiative it's a and then also, you know, sometimes players, this is my pet peeve, is players will escalate when they flip into video game mode. Yep. You know, and they're like, click and point, okay, point and click. you grab somebody's purse and he catches you and then he turns around and punches you in and the face. And they're like, I, I murder them. And they're like, I pull out my sword and I kill him. Yeah. And you're like, this and I'm is like, a civilian. Okay, pause. <laughs> pause, pause. Pause. Player to player. <laughs> this is a co-op game. We can go full murder hobo now. That's a different just game that I mind. think everybody signed up for. So why don't we just make sure we're all on board for murder hoboing or not? You can. The law enforcement will come for you. And but usually the pulling on the when when I when I it's not take Assassin's it Creed where game, you can just hide for five minutes and right. they stop chasing the assassin. Then then it becomes clear that the player is like, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't. I don't actually want to turn it. Yeah, yeah. You're right. like, oh, oh they yeah. Up. There's consequences in my actions. Mm-hmm. J.K. Rewind. But yeah, I think the other thing that these work well for passive use is in a specific situation is stealth situations and ambushes. That's clearly why perception was the first one they added mm-hmm. into the court game was for this because. When you start rolling, people are like, oh, something's going to happen. I'm of the opinion you should just use Fiat here as yeah, a DM. Yeah, like, uh, th- This is a system you know, for stealth and perception that they give that DMs in older editions, there's still a history of, I think, used to track like who gets perception and when. And elves got it a little bit differently yeah, incentivized, yeah. I think. Especially poor, for those magic doors. Poor behaviors at the <laughs> table. I, I think that it's a better DM choice for running the game practically at the table most of the time to just have it be fiat. You know, you don't notice the characters until the fight starts or until you, the DM, decide this is where the encounter well, begins. Yeah, you're usually but, like, that's the point of a stealth encounter is you have the point of when to engage, you know? If the player does, the, yes. Yeah. The player gets the yeah. choice. But I, if it's like the enemy, you know, yeah. and like there are goblins stalking yes, the party. it's different when it's the enemy stalking you versus you stalking the enemy. Totally different have, than how you, know, you play it. narrate yes. through it and then have them pop definitely. out with the encounter when you're ready. Yeah, I love having like my players' passive perceptions. Like it's definitely something that I've at least gotten the habit of writing down. Mm-hmm. Maybe a couple other skills just so I know mm-hmm. so I can like throw things around spotlight properly uh, but like the thing that to understand about passive skill usage is aside from like making it easier to kind of plan the sessions and do information management because if you know their perception you're like okay they'll probably notice this or oh with this passive skill they'll have no problem doing this uh, so it does help planning a little bit because you kind of know like what their base ability is Mm-hmm. And if you use it, it's more consistent than rolling. So that can help, especially if you know you're like, okay, I want the most aware character to like notice this thing in the room or notice this bad guy because that's what they do. They're the, they're the right. ranger. They're Aragorn. They notice it right. from across the room, you know? So there's that. But it also is cool because it actually encourages action, right? Passive skill use usually sets up active skill use, right? Like if, if you're like, 
it usually sets up exposition for the DM too, right? Because you're usually offering like clues, warnings, and hooks with the passive skill use. Like when they walk into the room, you describe what they see with their passive perception, right? And that oftentimes, and maybe you describe something and they're like, ooh, I want to actively search the room or ooh, I want to go check this out. Oh, I want to investigate that bookshelf. This is an area that I have such conflicted feelings about. Uh, passive perception, I love the idea of it. And also, from a table mechanics perspective, I don't mean additive numbers, rules mechanics. I mean mm-hmm. what's going on at your table. What happens is you, the DM, either have all of the players' passive perceptions and have prepared notes for what they notice in every room ahead of time and then hand out secret messages to those who notice it based upon passive perception, which is the <laughs> best feeling at a reasonable amount of work. Yeah, you can go that route. It's or, a lot of work, though. Right? Or what happens mostly is you say, okay, whose passive perception is what? You know, And then people will shout, who has a passive perception, whatever it is, and you tell the person at the table who has, <coughs> excuse me, the, who has the, the best passive perception what the thing is but everybody at the table heard it yeah they all hear it but it, it makes that player special because you're like your character notices it this it does and i think and, and you make it special in front of everybody but they all often have they at the all, player level they all have right. the info and often that makes it hard for them to separate the player and character player information and character yeah, knowledge that can right? be tough so there has to be and, and it's not by any intent oftentimes it's just like a bunch of people are excited at the table and somebody has an idea and they'll shout it out loud you know so and that's fine and there's, that can be good it, for a certain it's game it's okay to it, shift between player level and game level but also there are plenty of players who are like dude your character wouldn't know that and so i uh, don't you know yeah, and they get of course, it fussy about happen. it so I, th- I, what I ask is, what's the better way to handle this? There's got to be a better way to handle this, you know. And I think that where I landed on it is the kind of game that this runs best as is the kind of game where if anybody gets it, it's like a party game. If anybody gets it, everybody gets it. You can do you know? it that way. You just so gotta be careful. You got it. You assume that they share the information yeah. with well, all. Well, yeah. Group, I mean, you would you know? assume they do, right? So like, then you tell. You it don't want to be them. like, oh yeah, no, you you guys don't talk to each and, other. And also on a practical level, just like it takes time. Amongst a group, if you distribute information asymmetrically, yeah. and unless there's conflicting information, like I'm going to send player A this mm-hmm. message, I'm going to send player B the opposite of that yeah, message. Yeah, it's just a lot of work. Right. Here's and the thing, and it just takes time because it will resolve itself, yeah. and, and the players are working together, so they'll figure it out. But now and you've unless wasted Unless you take like, those notes back right away, they're just going to pass them around or communicate to well, the other players. They'll often you know? blurt it out, yeah. hopefully. Or they'll accidentally say it. say it, yeah. So it just takes time at the yeah. table, you know, and you have only a certain amount of time for and a session. And that's why I like to have the passive perception because I can skip that whole process. Right. And I'm like, all right, Jimmy has the highest. And as they walk in the room, it's not like, oh, only so-and-so knows this. But I'm like, hey, Jimmy, like as you guys walked in the room and they asked what they see, I describe the room. And I then I'm like proficiency for this. Right. And then I'm like, oh, but you also notice right. this because you're, you're, your ears prick up. You're more aware. Right. You're more trained for the sounds of a beast creeping and stalking through the woodlands, you know, something like that. And they're like, oh, cool. Because they're getting payoff for that yeah. character choice they, they made. made that choice. Right? They made that choice of creation. And so you're still giving a payoff for, for a choice, right? I use, I use proficiency for that for that same and kind like, of thing. Those, like your choices should matter. Yeah. You and want those, them to be meaningful. And random knowledge checks that fail really disregards that sense of like, well, I used skill proficiency on that for no reason. It's certainly not serving me. Right. I mean, Gumshoe has strong opinions about this, but we'll come yeah. to that a little yeah. later. Exactly. So, yeah, I think also you were talking earlier about kind of like – reframing skills as a conversation, which I think is interesting because role-playing games in and of themselves are a conversation. They the are. The DM asks questions and gives answers. I, and I have a specific example I want to give, but before we do, I'm parched, and I, I want to take a, a stop in this here tavern here. Oh my God, there's one right here. For a brew. How convenient. It's convenient. Let's do it. Welcome to Tavern Talk, the part of the show where we toast to you, our awesome listeners, and we uh, talk about a quick brew that we have. So this week, I feel like we should tell the story of this beer. Uh, All right. Just as it came into us, you know, this beer is Hobgoblin. It's by Witchwood Brewery. It's an English ruby beer. Yeah, it's an interesting brew. It comes in a tall can, the one we have. Mm -hmm. You brought these over to here, to my place, more than a week ago. A week, over a week ago. They got shaken up a little bit. A little bit but in the not, backpack. Not, not, it's just in a not backpack. A ton. And then it sat in my fridge for more than a week because, you know, we were saving it for this. And all of the ones that we've opened, nonetheless, have, a, you know, out of the it top of the can. Foaming it foams like crazy. totally up. And it has on the, on the front of the can, 
brewed with roasted malts for a well-balanced, rich, smooth taste, and it delivers on all these things full of mischievous character. And there's a hobgoblin on there, of course. <laughs> He's mischievous. And He's I got think a good that, little battle axe. I think that that's, that's the mischievousness of this beer, is that it doesn't matter. It is brewed as the way you open the can. That's how it goes. <laughs> that's it's just what little, this one You know, does. it's like that snake tube. <laughs> and, you know, it's like a nice malty beer, and you sort of relax it with it. It's kind of malty for a more red kind of style beer well then you open another one that's why it's it's an english ruby beer and not just like a red ale or something so pretty malty pretty good easy to drink surprisingly light i like it on the palate for the most part yeah from a little bit of the malt there pretty good mischievous yeah they did a good job it's a witcher brewery hobgoblin where are they located they are located let's find out The UK. Product of England. That would make sense considering it says English Ruby. But which beer. part of the UK? What does it say the town? Let's see. Oxfordshire. Oxfordshire. Whitney, Oxfordshire. Nice. Shout out to our uh, UK listeners. Hey. You guys got some good beer. All right. Let's go back and talk about conversations and skills. All right. Let's go back to that. So for skills, I think I like to think of them as a conversation. And I learned a particular model for this uh, in a video game I played. You probably played it too, as many of our listeners probably have as well. Uh, some years ago, it was Knights of the Old Republic, the first one. The first one, okay. I played both. I played the fir- them both many times. The first one taught me something as a DM that I hadn't thought of. And it uses, if I recall correctly, a version of the D20 system to do it. Because it does, D20 actually. was Star Wars back mm-hmm. then. Or Star Wars was D20. So it has ties to D&D. So, you know, you have a character built off of a D&D base game in Star Wars land. And there was lots of dialogue options. You know, you usually mm-hmm. have three choices. And there are different branches that would lead you down. But they used abilities in a way that D&D didn't provide. You know, so in dialogue options, you could use wisdom or perception, or depending on for different kinds of things, it would open up a new dialogue yep, choice. Yep, if you your know. skill was proficient enough. Right. And in later versions, they would show you that it was there, but it'd be grayed out if it wasn't, if your skill wasn't yeah. high enough. Similar to like later dialogue trees you would see in games like Mass Effect. Not quite the same. Right. But, you know. So in my mind, this what, what I learned from this is like, oh, you know, that's a fair point. Like all of the things that you have a bonus in or a proficiency in or anything high, any investment that the player has made in that, the game should find a way to reward. Well, and yeah, definitely. In some, this, or at least give you the opportunity right. to and, get some out of it. Right, in this sense, for skills, you know, in mostly social contexts, this wasn't in combat. It wasn't anything like that. There's not a lot of specific rules for handling the social situations in d d it was, it was a great implementation of it, and I was like, oh, yeah, so it is basically like a conversation, and I have a new conversation avenue. And Mass Effect expanded on this later. You know, but it, it was basically you have you took proficiency in this social skill that gives you more options when interacting with the characters, and it was very video gamey. Like, oh, yeah, I have it's, this it's a dialogue tree when all is said right. and done. And which, if you look at a conversation the two people have sitting on a bus, it's a dialogue tree to a and, degree. Yes, and it maps very very it's clearly. So, like, more where, where does the conversation start? What are the range of options? We you know what are the topics they're going to discuss, and what's the and outcome so going to be? Hey, how you doing? There's only so many answers to that question, right? Uh, and, you know, if you look at it, it's like, okay, the weather, the environment they're immediately in, the person over there, I'm afraid of you, wow, you're pretty, you know, like, there's a lot, it's very complicated, but the Sims boiled it down pretty effectively when the Sims, <laughs> you know, like, they had interests, and they would meet, and they would talk, and there was a chance if they had similar interests. You see interests, the little, like, the up and down plus heart thing. Pluses, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, this is a kind of conversation. It's it's an exchange of these two different you know, it's desires. a good way to look at it because you know I'm big on the role playing game as a conversation. Right. That's why I like DMing because I just get asked questions. I don't have to know the answers. So I immediately it's think great. of my role as the DM when I when I think of this because I go, you know, okay, skills and the game itself really is an exchange in a conversation of back and forth. You do this, I do this. You do this, yeah. I do this. I think this, you think that. We do this. What's that? You know, yeah. declare action, adjudicate and resolve. Declare right. action. Acuity, or ask a question. You can ask questions too. Adjudicate and resolve. Right, exactly. It's, right, it's a very structured it's conversation. So that applies to everything, you know. So in a certain sense, from this perspective, everything in your character sheet is a quote-unquote skill. 
is yes. a thing you can use and for most an of action. them are for murdering <laughs> like yes, not 80 percent of that sheet is for murder <laughs> much of it like if you or, or not getting murdered a that's lot of pretty that much too. most of your sheet um which is i mean that's clearly what the game cares about and where we focus and zoom in the most in the granularity mm-hmm. um, but that's why the skills are so important to players like you and i who are like yeah i love combat in D, but there's there's not a lot of tools for outside of combat well, that are super liked, helpful. That's why I like Dice Little Republic as an example, because it took the very combat-focused 3-5 yeah. bones, and it expanded upon things that I didn't think of outside of yeah, combat it was or good. basic context. It was context very creative, for, especially for its time. Right. It was so ahead of its game. The thinking about it like ahead that... Ahead of its time. Ahead of its time. It was a game ahead of its time. <laughs> thinking about know. it like that, I go, all right, you know, I need to remember to remind myself and all of our listeners too you know like all of it are, can be a skill you have proficiency anywhere or a high skill score or high ability score you can use that you i know? mean there's also a lot to be said for just having like sometimes you just have a really good creative example that doesn't even require a skill check and it's just like wow yeah that'll that'd work that That's makes just, sense just just sometimes you need to reward people on the player level if it's realistic like maybe that six intelligence half work wouldn't come up with that right. but if they have a reasonably intelligent character and they have a really good idea yeah, let them have it let them use it like that's so satisfying as a player and like everyone at the table will like it if it's creative yeah. who knows maybe they'll surprise you and you're like this is such a better way to solve this issue i never saw this coming yeah totally um but that being said there's definitely pros and cons to the uh, 5e skill system as it currently stands a lot of both and it's important because D acts as like kind of the base role-playing game still to this day it's it kind of like the like the rosetta stone of it's role-playing flagship it's, of tabletop yeah, rpgs like, if you know role-playing games you probably know what D is and have an idea how it works i'd be surprised if you know if you, tabletop role-playing and games and don't know what D like, is. like you maybe you haven't played it but you at least know what it is right right because it does affect, you know, the rest of the industry and the trends that it sets and things like that. So uh, with the 5e skill system, there's there's some good pros, right? Like one of them is skills always make characters unique. It prevents you from just role playing yourself. Right. You have to pick a background and you have to pick skills. And some of them are things that I guarantee you don't know. Yeah. And it's great. Like you need that. You're right. Yeah. I think that uh, it also helps you save time. And like this is one of the things I love. It allows you to just sort of fast forward past parts that aren't like, really interesting. Like foraging. Yeah. So foraging for <laughs> You're food. You're not going to describe them like crawling around looking for mushrooms maybe, at the base of the tree. Maybe you do well, like twice. You do when there's like an encounter coming out of it. You do. Or and maybe <laughs> in a new biome. You know, right. you're in a new biome. Actually, they're mycinid. Surprise. Right. You know, but... I think that you're right. Like mostly, it's like okay, and and crafting uses if it, if it yeah. the same example profession as well, right? Yeah, these were like off screen, off yeah, camera. Yeah, it kind of lets you do those off camera kind of moments a little bit. And a game like D and D that doesn't work into phases at all, that's pretty helpful because you can control that compression and expansion of time. I, I think it does work in phases. It just not it does. In, They're not formal. They're just not formal. Right, and and not the three in the way pillars. in the way that other. Games yeah, they're not too. as formal. It's a, it's a newer thing in game design to be like, no, there's just these set phases. And D&D players like myself, when you look at that, you're so like, no, why can't I just freestyle DM all the time? And then when you do it, you're like, oh, I get it. This just creates the chance for those different conversations for downtime. You know, it's going to be more structured mm-hmm. downtime, which is it, important. It does. It does have it. You need it, the downtime for the uptime. To, they just don't call it out in D&D you know, explicitly. And yeah, they don't. They don't. But and all I, of I understand your rest why. time, all of your travel time. Yeah. All of that, you know. But a lot of other games structure that more. They so do. it's something to consider. Because um, when we look at the skill system, it rewards character building the most, right? Like, d and has moved away from this from 3.5 where you really got more from mas- more reward from mastering the rule system. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, players were really empowered to choose how they interact mechanically, right? You could be like, ooh, I'm going to be really good at jumping or I'm going to be really good at animal handling. Mm-hmm. And kind of the ability to choose that as your character leveled up instead of just making that choice at the start. Because sometimes you make that choice at the start and you're like, I'm not using the skill at all. Right. Like, there's certain campaigns where survival is just not going to be very useful. Right. And then you're going to have other campaigns where it's make or break. So... It just depends on the game that you're in. You don't always know, like just even with a good session zero, you don't always know at the start. Um, so that's another pro of like a skill system is that you know you got to choose how you interact mechanically with the game world. I think that's really important. I think that it totally is. You but know, I don't think five E's is adjustable quite enough. It's not. It, it it rewards your initial thought, but exactly like you and said, it puts you, you know, on rails. Later on down the road, you're like, I'm kind of, or even if you just like liked it back then and you kind of got bored of it later, you know, it doesn't mm-hmm. give you an option to continue making it interesting. Yeah. But it can lead to, I mean, 
it gives you another chance to roll. And one of the things that is core about D&D, and they lean into this pretty hard in 5th edition, is rolling that D20 is what they hang it around. Rolling is fun. It is, especially when you roll a 20, which is, yeah. I think, one of the reasons why sometimes that critical success in, right. in skills just gets persists applied because, because people are like, well, it's inconsistent, and I like rolling 20s anyway. And sometimes the DM's like, everyone's so excited, I'm just going to give it to them. Exactly. Like, I don't want to crush 20. the, right? And you're like, guys, guys, it's a skill check. And they're like, oh, thanks, Captain Buzzkill. Right. Like, oh, I guess, do we make it? Did I meet the DC? Yeah, right. But that's the big thing is universal DCs make it so much easier to improvise adjudication. Like you're just like, okay, like this is kind of hard. So it's a 20, you know, like, right. That's it's, the it's one easier nice for thing. Adjudication, it's, it's not as, it, there's a, there's a, there's an existential issue with this, which is sort of like, you know, are there, are there things that are just like universally hard? Right. Or yeah. Yeah. Is it scaled? You it know? doesn't work perfectly in a real world <laughs> but it makes sense. It, it makes it easy for running it at the table on the fly. But it's it, much easier it works for that great too. With bounded accuracy. Which, which I think is, <laughs> which I think is sort of the crux of 5e is that it's streamlined. It is. They, and, and that's accessible. part of why it brings so many people into it and why it's yeah. so good is that even though it has a lot of. I'm gonna call them warts. Mm-hmm. Uh, it uh, it's not a bad way of putting it. It well, you know, it has huh. witches and hags and trolls. Yeah, it makes sense. It, it still brings people in, and it is easy to access. And so that it really shines in that area, you know. I but, definitely. I mean, it's the most accessible version of D and D we've ever seen, and it's doing great for that reason. I think is a big big reason. But there are still some cons with how we, you know, things you might want to bolt on differently or or change or yes, extend in the skills. There are definitely you know pitfalls to a. Any system is going to have pros and cons. That's just how game design works. You can't build something to do everything, right? Like a game has to do a thing well. Like it has to be designed to do something. You, mm-hmm. There is no true universal game system, even though GURPS would like to be. GURPS tried. There's things that it can't do well and things that it does well. So when we're looking at the cons of the 5e skill system, I think the problem, one of the issues is it makes player decision, ingenuity, and details of game world matter less. And this is something you will hear from older players who played before skills mm-hmm. were so focused because mm-hmm. they're like, well, back in my day, we just had to come up with creative ideas. And yep. and so you got more rewards on the player level, right? Because we were coming from war games where skill and, and ta- just tactical decision making needed to be rewarded. And so you saw more of this reward for player decision and player ingenuity. And there was less of that, oh, but like your half work might not come up with that solution kind of stuff. You didn't see that quite as much. Also, you couldn't play half works back then. There's also that. So that's a great point. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, you get less rewards on the player level with the skill system. Sometimes, you I know. I mean, yeah, totally you do. But I think... You it, don't have to engage. One of the interesting things about the cons, and this is... this is. Uh, it's something I really care a lot about, but uh, for this one in particular of having limited skills is that players have blinders. They have blinders about they what the creative they can play, on. about what classes can do, yep. about what skills can I do. Agree. And one of the things I spend a lot of time doing across time as a DM, just across the years with very with various different groups is giving them reminders about the things that they can do with their characters. So what are the tools that you do to do that? And a skill list is a skill list is the great greatest place to start, you know? Like here are the things that you should expect that your character knows. Like, Here's what they this. mean. You know, like here are your choices. Here's how you pick between them. And uh, and I think that it's okay to have blinders because a lot of us come to the game after a work day or a work week and are like, I I just want to check out and have fun with my friends. I want to play a game and... You well, know, I mean, that's how it should work. Kill you, monsters you declare and actions take and, their treasure. And the DM adjudicates it. But I don't want to necessarily, you, should, you know, especially for like a butt kicker type player, I don't want to have to worry about coming up with some creative thing. I want to say, my, my character knows this DM and I'm tired, but I do want to solve this problem. Can I roll this check? It's more of the point and click computer right. approach and that's fine. Like some people are going to play it that way and you just have to get comfortable with it. You're going to have that player who gets really into like the fiction first, describing their actions. It right. could care less how you adjudicate I, it. I like to expand the rules on them and just say, here yeah. are some extra proficiencies and that you can you'll have. You'll have the you player know? who will ask to do a certain check and it, you mm-hmm. know, it may be appropriate. Mm-hmm. You're like, okay, go for it. You're lucky they're asking. So <laughs> yes. you should just count your lucky stars. Uh, <laughs> Because, like, the other thing with too much rolling, I think we talked about this a little bit earlier, it Mm -hmm. creates, like, these impossible situations. It makes parts of the fiction just feel really inconsistent sometimes. It can be wacky. Or, you know, it makes a character not feel like who they are. Like, that character wouldn't mess that up. Like, they would never do that. Right. Like, you can, if you think about someone like Captain America, 
there's just certain things he's not going to mess up. Throwing his shield, it, for instance. Like, you just don't expect, like, it may happen, but it's like, it's just so out of character. So, in this is, this is back. He, he succeeds on his charisma checks, usually, okay? This is back to rolling a one, <laughs> right? Like, if you're, if you're proficient on these things, you should be, you should know how to do it. You should know how to not fail dramatically and badly critically at it, right? And... If you go back to three five as a, as the comparison and four e tried to solve this, the math of it was such where twenty being an automatic success, one being an automatic failure. Five percent of the time, even a twentieth level fighter would be hit by a kobold. Yep, an um, army of kobolds could still take Welcome him. Welcome to bounded accuracy. Well, I mean, three five didn't have that. It was just your twenties and ones that would yeah. do it. You know? Yeah, uh, even though it didn't, a god, you know, a god would be hit by a kobold five percent of the time, and uh, and that's true here in some degree as well, but. Um, one of the uh, different uh, extended rules that you could add on, I think they had another under mm-hmm. Arcana, was instead of 20s and 1s being critical success and critical failures, and Pathfinder 2 does this, mm-hmm. add 10 yes. or subtract yeah. 10. Yep, yep. Which, which is a great way to do it. It's a good way to do it in a system where you have that treadmill and you have big modifiers. Right. And it really and pays it, and you it, off And it addresses that. that inconsistency in fiction, right? Because... Yep. Okay, it's a bad it's day, but if I have it's, a plus thirty, I still succeed at the basic stuff. You yeah, know, like it's I'm a not, graded success. Right. I think I think that works. It's a little more math at the table, but I think you know, as it a is. player, you don't really mind it because, like, if you get the payoff, you're like, oh, cool! I really, yeah, and I, I mean, really it, killed it's this only check. ten, so whatever your add additive is, you know, like add another ten. Yeah, it's fine. Totally. I think the inconsistencies of the system is what causes kind of a lot of the constant mm-hmm. confusion of. Passive versus active use of skills or like maybe not knowing when to call for a role or when to just like adjudicate based on something else. Um, I think a lot of, you know, the, you, you touched on this a little earlier. A lot of players coming from prior editions, I fall into this category for sure, uh, go, oh, that's interesting. They categorize the skills very, very coarsely. And, mm-hmm. and I assumed that that meant that each one had a bunch of different uses that you would read, you know, like, okay – um, insight has like a broad set of, of examples skills, yeah. of various kinds of things, but it's not and written it's that not, way. It's not that. No. It's one quick little blurb, you know. So it's too coarse grained. It's only something that I'm kind of disappointed about with the way they wrote the skills in the book because you need to give a little more creative options there because you're just right. You're creating more of that problem of the creative blinders. They did a great job. With not like, only are they thinking these are the skills I can use, they're thinking these are the only things these skills can do. They give you a great, they do a great job with backgrounds. They give you like good incentives and mm-hmm. like examples and ways you can customize it. And they kind of, I think left some things on the table with skills. In yes. This area. I mean, they, I, I'm almost kind of glad they didn't try to jam crafting into it this time uh, it's, around. I mean, it, it's just, <laughs> they, they added, there's some in the DMG and what, you know, in the DMG, you have to have a formula and you have to go there's through a series of There's some in Xanathars to try to and, fix what was in the DMG. Right, but right. There's a, there's a, there's a big caveat though. Like such crap. Both, they have crafting and in DMG, it's, it's very loose. You know, it feels like, um, an extra bolt on for like, if you wanted it to feel like a dark Diablo style, have mm-hmm. to have a formula and all these kinds of things for the magic item. Xanathars uses that and makes it more. Honestly, I think most people just go for homebrew. But for, it requires a week to do it. For crafting. And I, I'm very much in the camp of like, I don't know. This this shouldn't be so hard to do, right? Like you were a blacksmith for Plus, ten years. You what should be able to make a sword. To crafting mundane items, which is the big caveat, right? Like where where is right. if the game it kills if the game me. hinges on you don't need a magic item Christmas tree anymore. Like you can run and play without it's, ever finding magic items that way. Then why don't we have any kind of anything about how to make a mundane? My army right. got burned away by that dra- the the dragon's acid. You know the green dragon's acid breath. Okay, well that's fine. I, I've made a lot of armors before. I want to make in my character's background why how do i make one you know what is it what does it need there isn't really much really no they're just like here's your background that's it like you get this one ability and some skill prof right and it's like okay like i'm pretty sure i could fix my own leather armor but whatever so i think that (laughs) like i said these are these are good areas to to bolt on extra stuff you know exactly and you know every system with skills is going to have pros and cons and it, it really comes down to that sliding scale of how complicated do you want to make it versus mm-hmm. how streamlined and accessible and the better the design, the more you can get those two to kind of meet. Mm-hmm. But there's always going to be a cost with that kind of design, right? Like either on the player or the system, there's going to be a burden put somewhere. So, I mean, let's talk about it in different types of games, how it manifests elsewhere. You know, so Pathfinder is, I think, a good, easy example because it, it's a common ancestor of D&D, and it, it fixed a lot of the stuff that people complained about in 3.5, and I think that with years of iteration, it got very, very good. It works really well. And it got very, very complicated, and 
I had this moment at one point with Pathfinder skills and mm-hmm. all of its different customizations that I thought to myself, this feels how like how I remember GURPS. But then I thought about that more. A little I was bit. Like, with how the, each skills had such an um, umbrella of there's skills just so under them. so many customization options. Yeah, it was so broad. But then I thought to myself, no, GURPS was worse. Yeah, it was. It <laughs> definitely was. <laughs> There's so, certain things GURPS is really good for, and, and some things through, where it's like, Meh. You've read through Pathfinder 2, so what did yeah, they, and they I, deviated big time from D&D. They're I, like, we're not doing D&D roots anymore. Pathfinder 2, I think, did a very good job looking at, like, what you called the warts on 5E's systems in some places, and just like, we're just going to cut and burn this one off. Hmm. Um, they went to the game designer and dermatologist there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, For example, the skill proficiency in Pathfinder is you can upgrade your proficiency. So untrained is plus zero. Trained is plus two. Like skilled or whatever it's called is plus four. And it goes up to plus eight. So at least as you level, there's something you can do there to improve the plus to Mm -hmm. your skill. You're not getting skill points. You're upgrading your proficiency, which I think is a great way to do it. Because proficiency is also present in Pathfinder 2. The skills, that part works pretty well. Uh, the cap goes up higher. You know, there's higher DCs all the way up to 40, I believe. Um, the ability scores are very similar as what we've come to expect. Not a lot of changes there. Uh, but I think they did a good job giving players a little bit more customization options. Um, Pathfinder's really built around uh, feats more than it is, more than 5e. Because 5e, that's an optional rule. Yeah. 5e is really designed around classes. Yeah. Where Pathfinder 2 is designed around, okay, here's your class. Here's the feats that this class gets. Um, here's the feats you get for your ancestry, which is what their race, which is race for Pathfinder two. Um, so Pathfinder two, I think did a good job shaving off some of those warts. They did that. I think the best place they did that is the action economy for combat. That's a conversation for another episode, Totally. but that thing is a, that is a nice piece of game design. Like I looked at it and I was like, Oh, Oh, Wow. Oh, yeah, that's great. I felt like probably how a car enthusiast feels looking at like a real nice hot rod. You're like, you're like oh, oh, that's, that's kind of sexy. That's nice. Ooh, that's good design. Nice work, guys. I want to use that raised shield action. That's how I feel about gumshoe with skills. And, you know, gumshoe, I think, is uh, it's a lovely little system in a bunch of different settings. And what makes gumshoe work really well is two things. One is they have a really big skill list. You mm-hmm. know? So skills are, I think, intrinsically for the crunchy-minded. And part of what makes crunch is having a lot of options, mm-hmm. you know, really for customization. It makes it feel good. You can really make what you want to make, make it feel like you want to feel. The other thing that did really well with skills is there are two broad categories. They're like general skills, like driving and fighting and mm-hmm. shooting and stuff like that. And then there are all of the investigative skills. It's an investigation game, yes. an exploration game. Which is tough to do at a table. It is. So you really need the rules to help it you. It nails it here. There are a bunch of those. And if you are proficient in one of the skills, you know whatever it is that that covers. You know? So if it's forensics, you know all, everything about forensics that you need to know at the crime scene. So it covers that active versus passive thing a right. little bit you, for you, you. It's both. You have it. Yeah. You can be active or passive. You know it. And and the GM who's running the game gives you that information automatically for free. Because you because you're proficient in that. That's in it. That's what right. you do. So your character investment matters. You can spend or roll to get extra, which is mm-hmm. just like a little bonus, but not required for the story's advancement, right? Whatever the clue is in the scene, the next encounter to get you there... You, whatever your players have at the table, one of their skills will be able to accommodate. So it's like the player choice really matters and it really feels impactful in that way. Yeah, your choices come back to pay back, essentially. Right, right. I also really like Fate, but for a different reason. And Fate has a bunch of different interesting mechanics for how you get to roll and when you get to roll. And I think that a lot of Fate's parts are great to pull off and put on other systems. Mm-hmm. But one of the things I like about Fate is that it includes in its skills combat that's true fate does do that they they put it all into one system they do which i thought was really interesting they do. so you can like you you can it treats equally and, I, and so often they're separate they are and I, and I love this idea and it, it doesn't have to you could do this in D for instance or other systems too it doesn't have to be uh tied necessarily to squares you know in, uh-huh. in D it, it isn't either you can imagine what is your your combat basically is your proficiency plus your weapon modifier plus any miscellaneous modifiers plus what you roll. That's very similar to – and your abilities. Very mm-hmm. similar to what you get with your skills. I think that 
you know, what's what's neat about that is that you can customize it too. And Fate has systems as your characters go on for changing what you're proficient in, changing your skill level, mm-hmm. where you can like decrease one and then add to another. So if you build a character and you're like, you know what, I think I want more fight, I can pull it out of this skill I'm not using and I can add it there, you know, after a couple mm-hmm. of sessions into more brawl or gunnery or something like that, which is really right. nice. Yeah, there's, it's been interesting to see new games handle this differently. Um, like Apocalypse World, for example, the way they do it is your character gets a playbook. And it's kind of like both your class and the skills that you can do. Essentially, it's it's pretty much your character sheet with more hmm. information on what you can do. Um, but it's, it's, it works a little differently. Like you have your stats. Like their stats are different. They're cool, hard, hot, sharp, weird. <laughs> you know, you got it. You know, it's an apocalypse game. Right. All right. Um, so, you know, but the thing is, you have moves that you perform as a player hmm. and the DM has moves that they put for as a DM and it works somewhat in phases. Um, so and your playbook kind of determines what moves that you get. Um, the, so there's people like everyone has access to certain basic moves as a player. And then based on your playbook, you get access to other plays or moves, essentially. It sounds like a um, card game. kind. Yeah, of. kind of. And, and then in that way, yeah, it, it's it's kind of interesting. It's almost like in D&D where everyone has access to these uh, these combat, like things you can do in combat. Right. But your class also can do these things. Yes. It's just your class features, really. Yeah. But I, I thought it was really interesting. And they, they, they approach it with a completely different, like, linguistic approach. Hmm. They look at it as a playbook. And it's really focused more on, like, you make a move as a player. You make a move as a DM. And it feels weird when you first look at a system like that as a DM because you're like, uh, I'm a DM. I'll make moves whenever I please. <laughs> I do Thank you. I want. I run the world. Thank uh, you. You don't tell me when to make my moves. <laughs> but it actually really works well in that game as a conversation yeah. because that's what it creates with the skills like we were talking about earlier. Well, Blades in the Dark has that Blades in the Dark too. does. It works very similarly. Like Blades in the Dark has a lot of similar design philosophies kind of to Apocalypse World, but yeah, it heavily focuses on the game as a conversation. Hmm. And it also heavily focuses on like the group, not the individual, right? Like you're a gang usually committing some kind of crime or a heist or something like that in Blades in the Dark. You're usually unsavory folks. Right. And your character may die and another gang member gets promoted and you keep playing with the same group. It's really fascinating because there they they take that conversational approach but it's as a group from like the group to the DM. And it's cool because in Blades, the players get a little bit more of that agency to like say, no, this happens. You can like, you know, you can an outcome could be determined and you could be like, no, I, I, I choose to like resist that or whatever. And I'll take on I'll take on stress or damage or whatever. And you're like, ah, no, that doesn't happen because fuck that. Huh. And it's like, oh, that's a strong narrative control. Huh. The other thing you see in Blades are flashbacks, you know. Like, oh, actually, flashback, my character prepared for this this morning when he did this. <laughs> I read about this. I actually have the knife ready to go. And it's like, oh, cool, okay. And that can work. It especially works well with heists and things like that. But, oh, my God, when you come into that game and that happens, it is so un- – like, because in d you don't just retcon shit. You don't rewind. Really like, no. It's, it's too much math. Oh, it's too yeah, complicated. It's you like, got to track oh, hit points and status effects and right? magic it's items. It's different. Places and to give up their loot. And, oh. Honestly, it's – it's for me personally, is one of the things in Blades that I kind of have an issue with. And there's games based on Blades that kind of put more limitations on it, on, huh. on flashbacks. But I think it's a really interesting mechanic. Um, but either way, just like kind of Apocalypse World, it, it has – you know, you make skill checks in Blades, but Blades is really focused on mixed levels of success uh, rather than D&D. Like, I like that. Like, there's almost always a cost. Like, if there's not a cost, you're like, oh, my God, yes, I did that without getting fucked up. Cool. <laughs> um, and that's kind of the thing with Blades, which makes it feel like, I don't know, a blade in the dark, a little gritty. Thieves. Because there's, yeah, there's a cost to most of your actions, to you or, or the group. Um, and I think that's really cool. I think that's one place where DE is very binary. You you win or you fail. Yep. And there's not a lot of those nice fail forward mechanics that keeps the momentum going. Like I've been in combats where no one hit each other for four rounds. And so we just role played it as all the characters were like really tired and they're just like, <laughs> well, this isn't working out. How about we just go our separate ways and pretend this fight never happened? You guys cool with that? 
Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. We're gonna we're gonna head out. And it was just because the DM had get you know had slightly not balanced the encounter correctly because he was new to the system. Huh. Um, but it, I think it was a Starfinder game. And we were just like, all right. Well, yep, that was fun. And we kind of just role played the end of it humorously and left it at that. It was <laughs> nice. more of like a street fight than an actual battle. You know, like oh, I guess I'll just walk away with a fat lip and a black eye or something. Right. Actually, no, because we didn't even hit each other. <laughs> and nobody, it's like G.I. Joe. It was, it, was, it was a whiff fest. So there are two more examples, I think, that serve as one that I found really interesting for skills slash abilities and one that I wanted to like and just bounced off of. I don't think anyone really likes it, <laughs> except for Chan. <laughs> so I, I find Empire of Dust really interesting. This is an indie this game. This is an from, indie game that it can 2008. be pretty hard to find information on. It You're not going to find much you, on you, it. You got to dig around. There are PDFs yeah. you can get online. Yeah. And, uh, it, it, but the crux of it was, uh, this was just after third edition was basically done and mm-hmm. 4E was not going to be open game license, but everybody had D20s they wanted to roll. And in this game, you don't have quote unquote skills. You have a bunch of abilities and they're like the abilities that everybody shares. And then there are some abilities you get based on which class you pick. You have to roll under your ability score. Uh, and oh, so roll under his back. You roll under his back, but <laughs> if you roll the score itself, it's a critical success and your score improves by one. Oh, that's cool. Yep. It's a permanent improvement? Permanent improvement. Oh, I like that. That makes and, me feel like I'm playing Ultima Online. And the, the way that the game was designed, the, they have, it has this game design. I got better at a thing from doing the thing. It has this game design ethos that the character you make is like an action figure. You imagine an action figure from old, you know, has like a karate chop or a special shooty thing and maybe some other thing like that comes signature with signature moves. Right, signature moves. And you have basically three pieces of equipment that you get. That's it. And all of the equipment does something. And it's a very combat-oriented game like D&D was, but it's a very minimal map. You know, they have this ethos of only draw the features on the map that affect the gameplay. Nothing else matters. Interesting. So walls, yeah. containers that explode, obstacles, vehicles. De- interesting, interesting. Super minimal. Yeah. But, but then also, like, you know, the more you use something, the more you roll something, and the more you succeed at it, 5% of the time, when you roll the number itself... Your stat improves. Well, I like, I kinda like that. One. Like, you should get better at a skill from using it all the right. time, right? Well, it's just like and what I Skyrim mean, and, experience you know, and Elder leveling Scrolls up. did. Yeah. But what was interesting about this game, too, is that in this very simplistic me- uh, mechanic, failure w- was very common, or mm-hmm. more common than in D&D by far. And it added game system uh, mechanics for when the players fail how hmm. what happens next you know how to gotcha. take take the teeth so it's not just like you fail and die like yeah. here's a table you can roll on did you get captured did you captured and robbed did you get imprisoned are you going to escape now did they leave you for dead did you get recovered by you know a friendly yeah, tribe yeah. and then you got to just like play with these action figures in this sandbox world it's literally a sandbox world isn't it it is it's sandy you know, it yeah, is it's it a is desert. And, and it, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> So, you know, I, like that. I thought this was a really novel take on how yeah. your characters skill up and improve mm-hmm. and uh, how you can deal with uh, failure in a game. You know, yep. I second inverted a bunch of these concepts and I learned a lot from it. And the other one is, and I love this setting. I love, I want to love so much. It's one of those so games much. where you're like, wow, what a cool creative setting. And then you look at the mechanics and you're like, oh, I just threw up on my mouth a little bit. <laughs> That's how I feel about Rifts. And there's so <laughs> much content for Rifts, you know, and I have some of the books somewhere and I love some of the, like, the, the content they put out as far as the setting and the stories are like, wow, that's really creative and it's so imaginative. And I, man, I wish I that understood cool. how to play that character type, you know, I, but it, the rules are very complicated and it mostly comes from uh, long lists of very specific skills, too much too in, specific. in the GURPS way and too much to manage, not well-organized information. You yeah. Know, it's just, and just not enough reward for mastering it to make it worth it. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, a big thing for me when I was looking at other game skill systems was games that use class and levels and skill points versus games that you improve your skills by using said skills. Mm-hmm. Right. And I, I remember I started playing, I think, Ultima Online and D&D around the same time. And this was a stark contrast to me mm-hmm. because I was used to classes. Like classes were in every video game I played growing right. up, right? Classes Final were Final Fantasy, thing. you pick your job. Thanks, D&D. That's why, right? Yeah. Final Fantasy 1 is essentially D&D and that's yep. why it's my favorite to this day. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need Cloud. I don't need Sephiroth. <laughs> no, I want to be able to build my party the way I, I want. <laughs> Stupid story characters messing up my tactics. Anyway. I won't fight you on this, but, <laughs> but it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> but I, I remember noticing the stark difference playing Ultima Online because I was like, wow, this is so different. Like, my character isn't defined 
by a class that I chose. My right. character is defined by the choices that I continually make. Yep. And this is what I was talking about earlier when a Dungeons and Dragons character just becomes a better version of what they already are. They don't really change, mm -hmm. right? There's not mechanics built into the game for that. There used to be, and the penalties were huge there if you were. made any changes. Like, you know, if your paladin broke an oath or whatever. Like, change you your didn't want you your lose character. all your experience. You didn't want life. to change because there's huge penalties for it. And that's so weird in a character focused game to me. It is. Um, and it was like, I remember noticing this when I first played Ultima Online alongside Dungeons and Dragons because I played with a lot of the same people in both game worlds. And I thought it was so interesting how in Ultima Online, you were just like, you used your skills and that's what you had. And if you wanted to be a good mage, you had to go practice in magic. Like right. you had to practice to get better. And I thought that was really, really interesting. Like your, your character's a amalgamation of all the choices you continually make, right. right? So I think one of the things that 5e does really well in skills is it uses proficiency very well. You're right. You know, characters are what they say, what they are. They're more of what they are. And, uh, I think that proficiency is a good mapping for that, you know, so, okay, fine. Ability plus proficiency plus context, you know, so for those of us who like to bolt on a little bit extra, maybe then you put it in context or add other modifiers, you know, you just five multi class, not stopping you. Yeah. <laughs> I tend to fall into the multi-class trap. I'm already multi-class. And then you know, people, people in my classes. party are like, why don't you have fireball? <laughs> Come like, on, dude. But I have so many different things I'm like, I could but do. But I could do other cool stuff at a lower power level. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so you have options, you know. But hopefully something in this uh somebody finds useful. One of right. one of our listeners maybe they just thinking about skills and how to extend it in the game. I think this is this is the first area I would start. You right. Know? You can always add more feats, sure, yeah. for customization, but skills Easy. skills are a great way for adding a little bit of crunch. Yeah. And and I I think that you should be comfortable enough coming up with a skill list that fits the tone of your game. I think for me, my biggest tip on skills is learn how to use active versus passive skills mm -hmm, properly. Mm -hmm. If you can do that, you'll solve a lot of headaches for yourself. You'll make your players feel empowered and mm -hmm. like their choices are paying off and it makes it easier for you. Okay. Without any further ado, until next time. <laughs>